uh, they've got some pictures of how the cars are actually assembled uh, by the company that built them out in Iowa. So that when you're riding on the car, you just have to look up toward the ceiling and you can actually see a, a progress uh, report in pictures here of how the cars were actually designed and assembled uh, back in 1984. And these are as authentic as they can be, right? Oh, absolutely. In fact, the, the wheels and the motors underneath were, were brought in from uh, Australia where there were still some cars available uh, that they were able to, to get salvaged parts from. Uh -huh. But other than that, the cars are completely scratch built. Isn't that beautiful? Even the lights, the 56 volt uh, light bulbs uh, that you see in the ceiling there are authentic. Did I note some period advertising too yes, on, the, on the wall? Yes, they do. There? And uh, this is an interesting piece. This is the old uh, fare register so that the, the conductor was kept honest. He couldn't pocket some of the fares because this had to be pulled for every fare and registered. Huh. This is one of the, uh, one of the conductors uh, right here uh, talking to some of the passengers on a typical trip telling them a little bit, a bit about the uh, history of the cars mm. and about the, uh, the Lowell Park. Didn't they ever take pride in the way they dressed in the oh, uniforms? And, absolutely. Uh, the way they presented themselves. The spit the and public. polish, sure. yeah, almost military bearing, that's right. Yep. Uh, here we see again this, this closed car and uh, they're coming along some of this former Boston and Maine industrial trackage and uh, all that had to be done here was uh, to have wire uh, constructed overhead for the power supply. The uh, Boston and Maine still uses this track uh, in the evening to deliver freight to some of the, the uh, factories here which are still operating. I think there's a paper company yeah. uh, that gets some uh, product. You mentioned though that they, in the old days, they did now have a flag made. No. The trolley ran, coincided with, That's the, right. with the automobile. That's right, and but people understood that. This is more or less treated as a railroad uh, car. That's right. Point. That's right. So here you have safety first, so they flag all the places where the trolley actually crosses a, uh, a roadway. Uh -huh. But this is so authentic looking because you have the trolley in an urban setting as opposed to what you would have, say, at Seashore Trolley Museum uh, up in Maine where it's out in a field. Not that trolleys didn't run in them, but it's just it looks nice to have it in an urban setting. Yep. Uh, here we're looking at one of the open cars. They have two of these. And during the summertime, this is what you'll ride on if you go to Lowell. And again, this is an exact replica of a turn-of-the-century open trolley car. It's about a 16-bench uh, size open car. And these are bi-directional cars. They are operated from either end. And the seats flip over. The back of the seats flip so that you can face in the direction you're traveling. And it has running boards on the sides so you can easily step up from street level. So there were no turnarounds like a roundhouse. Uh, That's right. You didn't uh, need to. system. You just went back and mm -hmm. forth. Bi-directional. Flipped the uh, mm -hmm. poles. Mm -hmm. Here you see the trolley pole up against the wire, and that shows how that was uh, suspended. And you pulled it down in the direction away from uh, the, the direction you were going, so that you had the, the rear pole was up at all times. The forward pole was down. Mm. Well, these people seem to be looking forward to a pleasant ride. Mm -hmm. This is free of charge, is it, uh, Rich? Yeah, I believe it is. Uh, it's usually in conjunction with a tour of the mills and so forth, but you can also go up strictly as a transient and, and ride with them as long as there's room and uh, there's mm -hmm. no charge. Mm -hmm. It's fun, too, to watch people that have never, ever <sighs> ridden on a trolley car, and, and this is a totally new experience. Yeah. Well, you know, you'd have to be at least, what, 60 years and older mm -hmm. to have uh, been around when, That's they were, correct. when they were running. That's and, correct. Uh, Here's one of the park rangers there in the foreground. And again, just like any park, whether it be Yosemite or Grand Canyon, they all look the same. That running board and seeing her climb up there reminds us that in the old days, a lot of people used to sit by the side of the, of the trolley stops and watch for the ladies to climb aboard so they could see a little bit of ankle under those long gowns. <laughs> That's a nice shot here. Yes. Rich of the front. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, you can see how the motorman was right out in the open. There's no windshield or anything. And these cars would move right along. They'd do 25, 30 miles an hour. Mm. And the motorman was right out there, you know, with the wind in his teeth, literally. Yep. These are, this, of course, is one of the earlier models. That That's, right. That's right. That's mm. right. 
on a, on a warm summer day or a summer evening, uh, so they tell us, uh, this was a great treat um, to get cooled off in an era before air conditioning and electric fans. I would imagine so, for an investment of about a dime. A or dime or a nickel, a probably nickel. a nickel. Yep. You mm -hmm. could have a nice, enjoyable evening. Right. Here we're looking at the uh, control stand of uh, one of these cars, and you see the, the uh, speed controller, which is on top of that wooden console, and then the round wheel is a hand brake, and the gauge in the center is the uh, Westinghouse air brake uh, reservoir pressure gauge, indicating the pounds per square inch of, of uh, brake pressure in the air brake system. Uh, this was the latest in technology. Oh, yes. This was, this was state-of-the-art uh, turn of the century, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Isn't that something? And it's, it's all right out there where you can see it. I mean, nothing is hidden away with the uh, paneling or anything, all the piping to the brakes and the uh, wiring to the throttle controller and so forth. Uh, as you can see right here, there it all is. Yep. There's no, no secrets. And that's the view that the motorman had right there. Yeah, and you say the, these could make 25, 30 miles an hour? Well, probably even faster than that. Um, you know, electric motors back then were pretty good, and they could run these things at a fairly good clip. Mm. This looks like one of the closed yep, later is, on models, mm -hmm. Rich. This again is the closed car. And uh, these cars were, for the most part, uh, made of wood uh, with steel under frames. And the later cars, of course, like some of the ones we looked at earlier, had, had steel bodies. Yeah. And here you're going to see the modem and put down the uh, rear pole by pulling on the rope. And then he'll pull that pole off the wire and hook it under a little uh, piece of metal that's on the car roof. You'll see him do that. He'll slide it, swing it back and forth, and slide it under there till it catches. And then the, the spring reel takes up the rope. Mm. And they're set to, to go uh, in the direction of travel that they're going. Mm. This shows you the overhead wire uh, at a switch, actually. You can see the wire going in two different directions, and this is where the overhead wiring became a little complicated. Yeah. They must have had problems, though, when it got very icy, wouldn't you mm -hmm. think? Ice would throw the pole off the yeah. wire, and then, of course, then you lose your power. Right. And you had to get out and put that pole back up on the wire. You can see the little wheel that runs on the wire. Yep. And that had to be uh, centered right on the wire. There's a groove in that pulley wheel. Yeah. Gosh, that building across the street looks pretty authentic, doesn't it? It fits right in with the period. It really sure. does. It really does. Yeah. Well, here we have a, a little uh, youngster with a nice, happy look on her face there, getting ready to ride. But we're going to, in just a minute, Rich, we'll be taking a little ride ourselves, complete with uh, sounds and That's sights. right. You're going to so hear and see just what it feels like. We'll get, we'll get our audience ready uh, for that. Uh, the again, the, the, is this the open car? We're this is at? the open car, and these are the cross seat benches that run from one side of the car to the other. Hmm. And here we go. Okay, let's take ourselves a ride. Okay.
That was quite uh, a pleasurable experience. Indeed, and it's nice, yeah. you know, you look at these old pictures and it's nice to go back and, and actually have an opportunity to ride on, on this sort of thing and, and see what it sounded like and what it felt like. Yeah. You know, and of course for the older people, it, it really is a trip back. They remember it. We don't. This is true. And again, as we've said earlier, thanks to the preservation of, of places such as the Lowell State Heritage Park here mm -hmm. and what they're doing out there, we have a chance to relive uh, again these uh, these old uh, olden days and experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, for one, I would have I, I would have enjoyed thoroughly enjoyed being around during this period of time to uh, partake in this kind of traveling. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly today when we see all of the massive uh, traffic uh, tie-ups that we uh, hear about and get involved with in and around this area. That's right. Uh, to have a system which could take you literally here or there mm -hmm. and uh, with a relative, uh, relatively little effort on your part just That's to right. be on the right, right car. Mm -hmm. However, all good things must come to an end and the system itself uh, did uh, kind of gradually die off and I think maybe in closing our uh, program here, Rich, uh, we might want to make some comments upon uh, or about the, uh, the final days of the system and perhaps some of the factors that uh, led to the final closing of the, of the systems and the various uh, transportation systems here in, in this area. Uh, there was a cost factor involved here. Sure, there's a cost factor in everything, and uh, we have a, a little excerpt from uh, Sherman Mears' fine book, uh, The Essex Electrics, and we had quoted from this in an earlier program, and it's like this, the same thing that goes on today. The cost of, of a service has to be borne, and in the case of the, the line to Essex, for instance, it became part of the Eastern Mass Street Railway. And that uh, even that didn't salvage the uh, the service because they still lost money, and you say, well, how do, how do they lose money? Can't they increase the fares? Mm -hmm. And as as Mr. Mears points out in this article here, um, this again was after World War One. Model T Fords were becoming more popular; fewer people were riding, and that means that that each person would have had to pay more to make up for the ones who weren't riding any longer. And at the same time, you had. Uh, the motorman and the other people that work for the trolley car companies asking for more money. Same story that goes on today. Right. And you had the price of coal um, nearly doubling because of a miners' strike. Coal went from uh, $6.50 a ton to $15 and some change for a ton by 1920. And the average person is saying, well, so what? You know, what's coal got to do with, with riding a streetcar? Well, obviously, you have to, tr to generate your power, your electricity, and that's done, or at least it was then, with the coal-fired boilers. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the cost of coal has doubled, uh, and yet the fares haven't gone up, you're losing money. Sure. And it was presented to people around 1920 that if you wanted to have the service, especially this line down to Gloucester through Essex, they would have to either double their fares, cut service, or a combination of both, and people just would not pay the extra money and at that point in time a subsidy would have been out of the question. So indeed the, uh, the service ended and it says here, quote, uh, in early 1920 the trustees found no alternative than to suggest that public subsidy be made available by localities to meet the operating losses. A public hearing held in Gloucester early in June of that year revealed an overwhelming opposition to using tax money to keep the cars running. Eastern Massachusetts Street Railway Company then announced June 20th would be the last day of operation and on June 21 usable materials and equipment were moved to the Salem Division for further service. Power remained on the line another day while cars were moved from the Bass Avenue barn down to the Essex Falls barn for indefinite storage. And it goes on to say that several years later when Route 22 was rebuilt along Western Avenue the rails and poles were removed and at the uh, car barn, the old cars, which were then too outdated for use anywhere else, were no longer needed as collateral for unpaid loans, were pushed out onto the trestle in front of the, the car barn, hoisted over the side to the ground below, and burned. Huh. And so that ended pretty much the line from Ellis Square down to Gloucester through Essex. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we know, the, uh, the line from uh, 
Beverly up through to North Beverly and Wenham ended about 1929. And uh, the cars continued to run until 1937 into downtown Beverly when they too were replaced by buses. Yeah. So it became a case of, of an ever smaller system, ever increasing costs and a change of philosophy. Um, people were driving in cars and what few were left, it was considered more economical to use buses. Yeah. But yet in a few communities, I'm thinking of San Francisco, uh, they still seem to be able mm -hmm. to have found a, a, a use for them. I mean, San Francisco is unique because it's very hilly. Yeah. And